Hello, I'm Devil Joe. This is a post commentary on an any percent speedrun of Deadbolt. This video is meant to be used for marathon submissions, but at the time of recording, it is also my personal best run of the game. I'll talk about the game itself in a bit, but first I should mention the fact that I'm skipping the tutorial level right here. Because the game is structured around missions and the tutorial is considered a mission, you're able to exit out of it from the menu without having to go through it. This gets us right into the first mission of the game, but it's pretty simple, so I can talk about the game right now. Deadbolt is a stealth action game by Hapu Games. It's more or less a series of isolated missions where you play as the Grim Reaper, and your job is to eliminate the undead. The important thing to note is that you die in one hit to basically anything, so using stealth to catch enemies off guard is pretty important to the gameplay. You can see it right there in the first level where all I had to do was clear out all the enemies, but things get much more complicated as more aspects of the game are introduced. The second mission, along with many after it, has a dialogue skip at the beginning. Basically, there's a retry level, level option in the menu that instantly kills you, and using it skips the cutscenes at the beginning of any level that has a cutscene. It's faster, but it also means that I die a lot throughout the run just to skip dialogue. The second mission also introduces what is basically the most useful weapon in the game, the hammer. The hammer is decently strong, but more importantly it is capable of stun-locking most enemies for the first half or so of the game. When the option becomes available, I'll definitely be buying a hammer so I can use it in every level for the rest of the game. For now though, like any other weapon, I can only use it when it's found in a mission and then once the mission is over, I lose it. At the moment, I only have the starting revolver available. Like you would expect, it holds 6 shots, and it's fairly accurate and does okay damage. I'll definitely be swapping it out for something better when I do my one and only shopping trip, but for right now it's okay for these levels. So while the most common objective for a mission is to eliminate all the undead, the first three levels are a bit more varied. In this level, for example, I have to make my way through an area destroying all the zombies, drugs, or whatever. It doesn't matter which enemies I get rid of and which ones I don't as long as I get all the objectives by the time I get back to my car. This means that I can run away from a whole lot more enemies instead of fighting them. It's faster, and it makes me look pretty cool, I think, so I mean, I'm okay with it. So in the run of this game, you'll notice that there's a lot of close calls where I almost die, or maybe I even do die. That's because a lot of the tricks rely on very exact moving and standing in the right place. Uh, standing in the wrong place or standing in the right place for too long or too short can mean that enemies move differently than I would expect them to. The first three missions don't really have this, but it, right up here there's a good example of it. So right here, something about the way that I entered and moved through the duct there uh, made the enemy move to the right when he's supposed to continue facing the left, which meant that I had to double back and shoot him, which was slower. That also reminds me that I haven't talked about moving through air ducts yet. Uh, basically, the Ripper can enter into air ducts for quick movement, and he's also invulnerable while doing it, but they're built into levels so they only have ins and outs at specific places. You also can't jump to get up into them if they're too high up, so you can fall out of them but not be able to get back into them. Up in this level, there's another small mechanic as well that is useful in two places right there. I can knock on doors to draw enemies towards me. Uh, because enemy alert sounds go over a pretty limited distance, and knocking on doors oddly makes enemies somewhat easier to surprise, uh, it's a pretty useful trick. I also see that I can turn off the lights to make enemies, or make it harder for enemies to spot me. Turning off or shooting lights is actually really powerful against most enemies, but it's not always worth the time to do since later rooms often have an inconveniently placed switch or multiple light sources that take a long time to shoot out. This next mission is probably the worst one in this specific recording. It's not actually that difficult, but there's a trick involving running past an enemy at a specific point so that he doesn't notice you. I move incorrectly and he catches me up right here. Yeah, right here. So, uh, he's supposed to be preoccupied with the light switch, but uh, didn't happen right there. Um. So, no comment on it happening twice, also. In fact, I'd rather talk about something else. Um, this mission actually starts you out with a silenced pistol. There are a couple missions that are like this where they start you with a specific weapon that you don't necessarily have to have. Um, it defaults you back to the starter revolver once the mission is over, which comes up way later. Even more interesting is that now we get to do our one shopping trip for the game. Uh, you might have noticed the soul counter in the top right which is the currency for this game. You get it by completing missions or getting achievements, but I don't actually need that many of them because I only bought those two things for the entire rest of the run. 
The two things I buy are Death and Taxes, which is a pair of revolvers, and a hammer. I've already talked about the hammer, but I'll talk a little bit about Death and Taxes. Uh, Death and Taxes is basically a straight upgrade from the starting revolver. Well, not exactly. Um, they're much less accurate, and individual shots do slightly less damage, but having 12 shots is just way too versatile to pass up. You can also see me going to town with my hammer right there, which is going to happen a lot, actually. You'll also notice that I was kind of dodging in and out of sight lines and abusing sound like right there to move enemies in specific ways. I like this level a lot, actually. It's pretty interesting. Partly because of the upcoming glitch. In this level, once you eliminate all the enemies, more enemies spawn in cars. The thing is that if they spawn while I'm inside a vent, then their AI doesn't start running and the game considers them dead, which means that I do not have to eliminate them to complete the level, so I can skip them. This comes up one other time in the game, and it's very useful at that one time. You also might have noticed the small lockpicking minigame up there, and that'll come up a whole bunch more times, so we'll talk about that later. Now we're reaching to the end of the zombie level, so I'll start talking about how the game is broken up. The game is divided into three sections with nine levels each. Each section would be representing a different undead faction, but for example right here you can see that we start getting the vampires in the end of the zombie levels because it's just, you know, part of the story transition. I don't really plan to talk about the story all that much. It's fairly subtle, actually, and the there's a lot of text involved that I skip over or don't read, so it's not too important, but basically what I said at the beginning is all you really need to know. I'm the Grim Reaper and I'm getting rid of all the bad undead people. There's a bit of a subplot going on right now about drug trade and it eventually builds into something pretty interesting, but I'm not going to talk too much about it during this commentary. Basically, I would encourage anyone who is interested at all in this type of game to pick this up, because it's a pretty cheap game and is also pretty high quality and I like it a lot. Coming up here is actually another small glitch, but not a fun time-saving one, just one that makes the screen turn black for a bit. It has something to do with pausing and hitting restart at, like, its very exact timing. I don't know exactly what causes it, but it shows up a couple times in the run. Also, this is just about the most anticlimactic boss fight ever because I've already finished off the big zombie guy right there, and that's it for the zombie levels. Heading into the vampire levels, I feel like the game actually gets a lot more open. Even though it's still small, segmented levels, It's it feels a lot more like there's a lot more options for what you actually do. Not necessarily in the speedrun, but just in playing the game in general, which I think is a lot, a lot of fun for this type of game. Even though this is a speedrun right now, and everything is planned around completing the objectives and getting back to my car as fast as possible, I still play this game casually sometimes if I just feel like having fun, because there's a whole lot more options that are explored in the speedrun proper. So the vampires aren't really functionally different from the zombies. They pretty much do the same things, whether it's shoot you or try to melee you. They're just kind of taller and faster. Also I guess they can stand on the ceilings, which doesn't make a huge amount of difference. They can still be taken out with the hammer fairly easily, except for the lady vampires which run at you and when you hit them with the hammer, their animation resets, so they're kind of getting stunlocked but they're still moving. They can't attack but they can still move. It's strange. And I don't really have a comment on this. That can just kind of happen. So this level is kind of big and sprawling and has a whole lot of enemies and probably the highest body count in the game, if I'm thinking correctly. At least in the speedrun, definitely. It was actually a bit of a routing nightmare for me for a while because I had a pretty bad route for it that was very inconsistent, but uh, managed through it by just copying somebody else's route. There's been a decent amount of collaboration on this game, just between the few people who run it. Anyway, even though the level starts with just the objective of kill the active vampires, you end up having to kill all the uh, dancing ones too. Dancing vampires are very hard to draw aggro from, so you can just kind of walk by them and hit them with the instant kill sledgehammer. Sledgehammer is very powerful, but very slow. It's a, you know, just a normal trade-off for video games. 
So level 3 of the vampire levels uh, introduces a new enemy type, but more importantly it introduces a new mechanic. The bartender enemies in this level all have phylacteries. Basically what that does functionally is any time that they die they will respawn after a while as long as the phylactery is still intact. So you have to find and shoot those before you can actually kill the enemy. That is, kill them permanently and be able to pick up their weapon. Uh, another thing that I do here is take advantage of the 10mm pistol being able to shoot through walls because it's so powerful. It doesn't actually do that much more damage than a regular handgun, but it has high penetration, so it's pretty useful for hitting objectives like that, which comes up a couple more times. Not all bartenders for the rest of the game have phylacteries, but a lot of them do. Uh, any, any enemy can have a phylactery, but it's usually reserved for fairly important story characters, or in this level at least, some more of the bartenders. This level is also pretty big and sprawling, but it doesn't have any new mechanics in it. It's just kind of, after you've been introduced to uh, all the stuff so far in the vampire levels, it's like, okay, here's all the things together, see how you do. I guess since I have time and there's a couple of them in this level, I'll talk a little bit about the lockpicking, because I did say that I would. Uh, lockpicking is random exactly how where the positions are. Uh, it always alternates back and forth, but the specifics of it are all random, so it's, it can be a little finicky sometimes. The doors are usually pretty small, so it's not a big deal, but for like large safes, you can gain or lose precious seconds based off of just randomness. There's not a whole lot of randomness in this game as far as I know, but the lockpicking is a little random. I think the biggest random thing would be bullet spread from your gun, because I still don't know exactly how that works out, but it is there's a fair amount of spread on pretty much all weapons, so it can cause problems. That's why you can probably notice that I almost never assume that I've gotten a headshot in one shot. I always shoot enough that I would kill the enemy with, with just straight damage. So this next level has a fairly interesting gimmick where the two boss characters at the top of each of these buildings is... they are each other's phylacteries, basically. Both of the buildings are connected by a vent that is closed off, so you have to get up both buildings the normal way before you can move between them quickly and then take them both out before they respawn. So I think it's a well-designed level. I've seen routes where you go to the left building first or the right building first, I'm just going with the one that I'm most familiar with. And then right here is a good example of me just shooting like crazy because I don't have time to react if I get a headshot or not, I just have to make sure that I kill her before she kills me. That's, you know, the big downside of having one hit of health for all sources of damage. Actually, you can get kind of clipped by small amounts of bullets if they, like, pass through doors or something without dying, but it's not really good to rely on that. You should basically assume that you're going to die in any hit of any kind. So up in this next level there are another new set of enemies. They are called... I believe they're called Nightcrawlers or something like that. They are actual bat people for vampires. They always carry silenced machine guns, uh, and they pretty much always drop them, which gives you a lot of ammo to work with. They can also see perfectly in the dark because they are, you know, bat people. They actually don't show up all that much more for the rest of the game, but they are a bit threatening just from having a lot of health and also being able to see in the dark. So once I clear out all the enemies in this level, um, it does the spawning enemies in from cars thing again. You'll notice that I'm able to move during the cutscene because I'm in a vent. Vents are kind of weird in this game for that reason, and also the reason that it, you know, kills spawning enemies even though they're not really dead. So by using that glitch I'm able to spawn all three waves of enemies even though you normally have to go through them one by one. I also use this mine in order to cause a distraction which pulls everybody upstairs so that they don't see me leave. It's a little bit faster to distract them rather than kill them all. Just a little bit. It's also a little bit more risky because you notice that those guys saw me at the end there and if they turn around at the wrong time they can actually just instantly kill you and you have to do the level over again. This next level actually feels really smooth which is kind of cool. Oh and there's that glitch again. 
the skeletons from the next part of the game start showing up, and I think I like skeletons the best. Mostly because their levels are really fun. Uh, this next section right here I actually kind of do really close. You can see that I got the achievement for killing that enemy while he was swinging his hammer, which would have killed me if I had been a few frames slower. I could have played it safe there by not moving to call the elevator and instead immediately start shooting, but you know, it's a speedrun, gotta go fast and all that. After you get the information out of the safe, more enemies spawn, but I don't think that the line of sights were like thought of correctly because you can just kind of do this and get out without anybody seeing you. Even the enemy that spawns right in front of your face. Even though there were skeletons in that level and are in the next level as well, um, we still have a couple more vampire things to do, so this next level I think is really interesting. The main gimmick is that it's timed, but because this is a speed run, the uh, time limit doesn't really come into play. The more interesting thing is kind of using sound a lot to move enemies around so that I can uh, get back to my car really quickly once I finish the objectives. The Tommy gun that I pick up right there is very loud and it's useful for pulling the female vampires out of the way because I have to leave through that door much later. This level also spawns in more enemies from cars, but they just come in and start moving upstairs so I can ignore them and move directly back to my car without having to mess with them at all. But that's really only because I pulled the other enemies out of the way like I did. So in the last vampire level you fight a boss with uh, seven phylacteries. She also moves very fast and has a very fast auto shotgun, so uh, avoiding confrontation is very important. I make a small mistake here with regard to bullet spread because I want to shoot that male vampire on the far right, but the bullet spread doesn't cooperate with me on the first try. It's right at the beginning of the level, so it's not a huge deal, but it is another death. Basically, I wanted to hit that guy to pull these female vampires into this room so that the boss would be by herself when I come back to her later. Since I have her by her own, she can just kind of wander around up here, and I don't really care that much where she goes. But she happens to go to the most convenient spot, so that's really nice of her. Pretty much the rest of the level is just go into each room and clear out all the enemies before shooting the phylactery in the room, but the next one I can shoot through the floor, which saves a little bit of time. And then, like I mentioned, she happened to go to the best spot possible. Right next to my car! So now that we're into the skeleton levels, I feel like the game really hits a stride of really cool levels that I like a lot. Uh, the next five levels are probably my favorite set in the game. Even though they're all pretty much go somewhere and get information or eliminate all the enemies, it's the variety of uh, weapon drops just kind of makes it feel really cool, along with the set pieces are pretty nice as well. Basically, yeah, this is my favorite part of the game to play. Uh, this recording of it doesn't go perfectly, but I don't die, so there's that at least. Then up here is the... probably the best gun in the game, the bolt-action sniper. It basically kills everything in the game in one hit, except for those large skeletons and I think a couple other enemies that have a lot of health where it would have to headshot them, but it would still kill them in one hit. Uh, in the vanilla game, at least, there's not really any opportunities where you're going to be shooting enemies from past levels with the sniper rifle anyway, so it doesn't make a huge difference. It would probably come up if you were looking at fan-made levels, because there is a map editor for this game and there's Steam Workshop support for it. There are quite a few interesting maps on there, but that doesn't really matter for the speedrun. <laughs> This next level is uh, structurally sound, and it might actually be my favorite level in the game. Uh, unfortunately, in this recording I make a few small movement errors, which make it look not as smooth as I'd like, but I think it's a really fun level. So I walk a little too close to this skeleton, which means that I have to walk, or I have to swing the sledgehammer twice, 
but it doesn't matter a whole lot. If I had moved perfectly at the beginning of the level, I still would have had to wait for like a second or two for that large skeleton to turn around anyway. I need that big guy to see me so that it alerts the guy above him, and there's a few things like that where I'm just kind of using the sound to draw out the next set of enemies. I also really like this level for the ending, just because I get to jump off the roof of the building and land directly into my car. The timing on that is actually pretty tight, but missing it doesn't kill you, it just means that you have to sit through the landing animation, which lasts maybe like half a second or so. Level 3 of the skeleton levels is interesting because it's basically two levels that are fairly small and they're stuck together. You have to go back and forth between them. Something weird about moving between levels in this game is that it only keeps one of the weapons you have equipped. It is the whichever one you have in your hands at the moment of the screen transitioning, so I make sure to keep the bolt action rifle with me for the entire level. You also probably noticed these guys in the last level, but those techie enemies drop mines that they are not immune to, and I use that a lot because the first thing they do when they become aware of you is drop a mine. And then there's another new enemy type right here. Uh, these guys can revive any enemies that are on the ground into another skeleton, so they only show up in a few places, but they're annoying if you don't take care of them quickly. In the next level, one of them gives me a little bit of trouble just because he doesn't move in the way that I usually see him moving. I also choose to do a bit of a riskier strat here. So up in this room, the safer strat is to go and get that bolt-action sniper rifle, but I choose not to do it just to save some more time. It leaves me with very little ammo, and also one of the enemies doesn't move the way that I was expecting him to, which means that I kind of have to double back and lose a bit more time. The sniper rifle is out of the way, and also is behind a locked door, so I'm not sure how it evened out in the end, but right there I would normally be able to just shoot that enemy and then leave, which would draw the enemies in the lower room up, allowing me to go down and then get out without being bothered by them. Instead I had to do a bit of maneuvering to move some enemies around, but it worked out okay and I didn't die, so it was okay. Mission 5 of the skeleton levels is pretty interesting because there's almost no enemy combat, it's just kind of you have to maneuver through a bunch of traps. It's fun when you're first playing it casually, but once you know all the tricks to it, it's not really that hard or anything. For example, right there, I just immediately opened the door and pulled the shotgun that was rigged to go off off the wall so that it couldn't shoot me. All the wires that connect all the traps are visible, so you can already see what's happening, so it's not like it's a big surprise, but there's a bit of puzzling when you don't know what you're doing to figure out how to get past everything safely. Up here there's a trap where you're supposed to pick out the correct uh, switch to set off all the grenades in the next room. I normally skip it by just throwing my hammer into the room, but I messed up the throw, which meant that I did have to hit the switch. It lost a little bit of time, because if you throw the hammer in, then everything just blows up instantly and you don't have to wait for the spark to go on the wire there. So after mission 5 of the skeleton levels, it kind of transitions into demon levels as well, and kind of pairs those two together. I'm not exactly sure why, but skeletons just get a bit less time. They have to share with the demons, I guess. Just like every other set of enemies, the demons have a fast-moving melee enemy, and a slow-moving gun enemy, and a big enemy with lots of health. There's kind of a pattern emerging that you might see. You also might notice a small trick that I do in this level with taking cover. Because when you take cover, it's always on the left or right side of the of the object that you're taking cover behind. I use it a bit here because the cars are so large to move a little bit faster. Most of the time it's not worth it, but those cars are large enough to make it worth it. Unfortunately, if you mess it up, then that means you move backwards, but, you know, that only happens once. It's fine.
This next mission starts you out with a grenade launcher. Remember back way back in the zombie levels when there was a mission that starts you with a silenced pistol. This one starts you with a grenade launcher, so a bit of a difference there, but it's still pretty useful. If the enemies had moved a bit closer together, I could have taken them all out with fewer grenade shots, but it doesn't make a huge amount of difference just because there's enough ammo in the rest of the level to clear out all the enemies anyway. Ideally, I would just have three grenades here for these three enemies, and then I would just do the rest of it without any more grenades, but didn't happen. It's fine. I'm not really sure why on this part, but after those enemies there's really nothing left in the level. It's just kind of, you have to get to the top to get information, but the rest of the level is just kind of empty and then you have to walk all the way back down. It's just kind of chill out time, basically. I use it to get hyped up for the last two levels, which are really fun. So like I mentioned in the mission where we got a silenced pistol, uh, starting with a level given weapon means that you default back to the starting revolver in the next level, but it's not a huge deal in this level because you start right next to your car anyway. This level has a fun gimmick where you are being followed by a sniper the whole time. Uh, anytime that you're in the light, she will try to take a shot at you. She tries to lead her shot, but if you change direction at all, she has no chance of hitting you anyway, so you just kind of have to keep moving. You can also shoot out lights or turn them off so that she can't possibly see you, but I don't do that a whole lot. It's usually easier just to keep moving so that I can take, all, take out all the enemies. The audio cue makes it kind of really easy to dodge the sniper shots. And there's another level transition there, so I chose to keep death and taxes on me. It works to keep either the death and taxes or the three shot burst rifle. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. I mainly shoot out that light there because I have to pick this lock and she can shoot you while you're picking locks. Once you get to the top of the building, you get a sniper rifle and you can take her out in one shot. She's always in the same place, so there's not really anything to it. You just kind of point at her and shoot. I guess I should mention these guys so that the ending makes a little bit of sense. These are the guys that you work for, they're the candles. I think they're kind of like... spirits of life and death or something. It's not really explained explicitly, but... Uh, at the end of the game, we kind of go talk to the big, important... main candle guy, I don't know. I just feel like it would be weird if I didn't say anything when we got to the ending, so... So now we're on to the final mission, which is kind of a two-parter and is really fun in both parts, which is really nice. The first part is fun because it lets you ignore the objective and just kind of go, which is really cool. And the second part is fun because it is a really fun final boss fight and it also has a really great atmosphere. Basically, the game right now is indicating that I should clear out all these enemies in this house before I move on to the next one, but you can just kind of ignore that and go straight to the portal portal that the enemies are building for plot reasons, whatever, don't worry too much about it. I'll also mention that the candles that we helped in the last level are giving us supporting sniper fire, but I don't really need it that much, I just use it at the end here. I really love the atmosphere of this place, so it kind of sucks that I have to talk over it, but here we go. 
So coming up at this area transition, there's another like retry glitch where dying means that you go directly to the final boss instead of having to get more information. It's a nice little skip. The boss is Ibzan. Basically you have to kill him four times in order to actually win, and every time that he dies he spawns in a different place with more enemies around him. Where he spawns is kind of like semi-random. Uh, those first two deaths he always goes to the same place, but after this he just kind of goes wherever he wants. Uh, I just kind of have to react to it, and he was really really nice in this fight so it worked out pretty well. This showing of the boss fight doesn't really do justice to how fun it is, because just with how much random variance and all the stuff that he does. Uh, I've practiced this for like over an hour straight before, just because it's really fun. The timing for this game ends when I sit down in the chair here. Uh, this was a pretty good run just for the routes that I have, but it could still be improved just by removing the deaths that happened and playing a little better. Pretty happy with it though.